Parmenides, the ancient Greek philosopher of the 6th and 5th century BCE, has been labeled as both the father of metaphysics and the father of logic. His central concept was that of being, which took hold of subsequent Western philosophy. Parmenides would journey with the daughters of the sun to the gates of night, only to return with his sole poetic work, marking the dawn of Western metaphysics. The thought of Parmenides has often been presented as an unchanging monism, held in contrast to Heraclitus's philosophy of flux. Throughout this video, I'd like to explore his sole work on nature, four of its principal interpretations, and the specific relation between Parmenides and Heraclitus. Parmenides is recorded to have only written one work, which we have come to know as On Nature, whether or not it was a poem's original title. Unfortunately, the remnants of On Nature are fragmentary at best. Less than 160 of the text's original 800 lines are available to us today, through quotations from other works. Despite the popularity of Parmenides' metaphysical comments, the metaphysical treatise is only the second of three parts that constitute his poem. The work begins with a preface or proem, and concludes with a cosmological treatise which is often overlooked through introductions to Parmenides. The proem of On Nature is a description of a journey undergone by a young man. This young man is, presumably, Parmenides at a young age, although there is no certainty that the telling was that of his lived experience or a spiritual journey of his. Despite being the most whole portion available, the fragments of it begin mid-action. The mares which carry me as far as spirit ever aspired were escorting me when they brought me and proceeded along the renowned route of the goddess which brings a knowing mortal to all cities, one by one. The account of his journey continues until he arrives at the gates of night. Some have described this to be a spiritual ascension akin to enlightenment, yet, as he is carried by the daughters of the sun along the route of day, his journey is more likely to be circular than straight. Rather than a metaphorical enlightenment, the journey is a didactic descent into the underworld. One of the gates of night Parmenides is received by a goddess. And the goddess received me kindly, took my right hand in hers, and addressed me with these words. With this indicated, the rest of On Nature consists not of the words of the young man taken to be Parmenides, but rather of those of the goddess. What follows are words of a god, not a man. The goddess begins by stating her intention to educate Parmenides. It is right that you learn all things both the unshaken heart of well-persuasive truth and the beliefs of mortals in which there is no trust. This sets out the structure of the remainder of the work, two parts, that of truth and belief. The two receive a number of different names, truth and belief, reality and opinion, the way of truth and the way of seeming, the route of conviction and the route of mortals. But in each case, the distinction is the same. The former, second part of On Nature, tells of the unshaken heart of well-persuasive truth, and the latter, or third part, tells of the beliefs of mortals, in which there is no true trust. The way of truth begins with two premises or first principles. The first is that one must choose between being and non-being, for the two are contradictory and utterly uncooperative. To say that chairs exist negates the ability to say that chairs do not exist. The second premise implied is that there is thinking of some sort. With these two principles in mind, the goddess reasons that one must think either being or not being, for none can think both. The only routes of inquiry that are for thinking, the one that is and that is not possible for it not to be, is the path of persuasion, for it attends upon truth. The other, that it is not, and that it is right that it not be. Here, there are only two routes of inquiry into what is, and into what is not. Yet, at another point, the goddess includes a third, that which holds what is and what is not to be the same. It is not only that mortals are wrongly concerned about what is not, but that they equate what is not with what is. The goddess deems this route to be backward turning, but between the first two routes of inquiry, the goddess declares, 
inquiry into what is not to be impossible, saying, This indeed I declare to you to be a path entirely unable to be investigated. For neither can you know what is not, for it is not to be accomplished, nor can you declare it. The object of thought must be being in its fullest sense, exempt from non-being. One cannot think of non-being or nothing, because to think of nothing is not to think at all. The next fragment states, For the same thing is for thinking and for being. The goddess establishes a clear relationship between thought and being, yet the specific interpretation of this idea varies. Some have even seen this as an early form of idealism, and have translated it as, for thinking and being are the same. Scholars, like Grondon, warn against such a reading, and instead suggest a more relaxed approach, advising that it is rather to be interpreted as suggesting that all thought can only think being, and being is all that can be thought. This is the commonly held Russellian conception of Parmenides. No matter the specific interpretation, the goddess here establishes a relationship between thought, truth, and being that is the basis of Western metaphysics. Next comes Parmenides' thesis of being itself, wherein he employs logic before its formal creation. It is right both to say and to think that what is, is, for it can be, but nothing is not. These things I bid you to ponder. And it is from this that the eighth fragment will construct the features of true being, constituting one of the philosophical tradition's earliest, most extensive, and most important stretches of metaphysical reasoning. While I won't quote it in its entirety here, the fragment describes the attributes of being through deductive a priori reasoning. Just one story of a route is still left, that it is. The attributes of being include ungenerated, imperishable, a continuous whole, unmoving, unique, perfect, and uniform. Being could not be generated because it would have come from its opposite, non-being, and nothing can come from nothing. How and from what did it grow? From what is not, I will allow you neither to say nor to think, for it is not to be said or thought that it is not. Hence, being is ungenerated, and the same thing may be held for being becoming nothing. Hence, being is imperishable. Furthermore, being is indivisible because its division would suggest that it is something other than being itself. Rather, everything is full of what is. All the same, permanent and immovable, the immediate reflex is to take the Parmenidean being to be a strict monism. Since Parmenides, Western philosophy and science have been enraptured by the idea of a permanent and stable being. The eighth fragment just about concludes the way of truth, as the goddess says to the young man, at this point, I end for you my reliable account and thought about truth. From here on, learn mortal opinions, listening to the deceitful order of my words. This is the reappearance of the distinction between the unshaken heart of well-persuasive truth and the beliefs of mortals. Thought and true discourse has shown to tap into being, while becoming is found in the mere names drawn from the language and stories of humanity. The goddess tells of the mortal opinions whereby distinctions are manufactured and individual things named, as is the case for the differentiation between night and day, saying, For they establish two forms to name in their judgments. For one, the ethereal fire of flame, mild, very light, the same as itself in every direction, but not the same as the other. But that other one, in itself is opposite. Dark night, a dense and heavy body, Night and day, by this account, are only appearances perceived by mortals produced by the power of language. They are ultimately illusory. What follows is the way of seeming, or opinion. It is composed of the most up-to-date cosmological account of the world available to a 6th century Greek. Unfortunately, this second cosmological account is highly fragmented, so much so that one scholar, deals or dials, stated that, while roughly one-tenth of the way of truth had been lost, nine-tenths of the way of seeming has been lost. Despite this, the ancient testimonia tend to confirm that Parmenides sought to explain an incredibly wide range of natural phenomena, 
including especially the origins and specific behaviors of both the heavenly bodies and the terrestrial population. As from the eleventh fragment, how earth and sun and moon and the aether that is common to all, and the Milky Way, and furthest Olympus, and the hot force of the stars surged forth to come to be. Hence, there is great reference to something that had been priorly rejected by the way of truth, coming to be. The conclusion to the fragments appears as a conclusion to the poem as a whole, suggesting that only according to beliefs have things come into being and been named accordingly. This mirrors the introduction of the account by paralleling its description of the way of seeming as a treatment of mortal errors. In this way, according to opinion, these things have grown and now are, and afterwards, after growing up, will come to an end. And upon them, humans have established a name to mark each one. In the prior section, I attempted to simply present the poem with minimal interpretation. The reason for this is that one's reading of On Nature will be largely dependent on how they interpret the apparent conflict between the poem's two sections. The claims made by The Way of Truth, the metaphysical treatise, and The Way of Seeming, the cosmological treatise, are seemingly contradictory. The reconciliation between the paradoxical accounts, unified, motionless, and eternal reality on the one hand, and a cosmology on the other, is the text's greatest issue. Why are two seemingly contradictory sections included in the same work? Jeremy DeLong refers to this issue as the A.D. Paradox, using the Greek names of the respective sections. Although there may exist many interpretations, through this section, I'd like to explore four common solutions to the A.D. Paradox and their influence on one's reading of Parmenides' sole work. On the first two interpretations, the way of opinion is false. The first interpretation, which is by far the most common, presents a solution to the A-D paradox through dismissing the way of opinion as a simple articulation of falsehood. There is reason for its popularity, since the poem is ripe with examples wherein the section on opinion is put down while the way of truth is raised up. The introduction to the goddess's teaching and to the way of seeming specifically make it clear that the opinions of mortals are lacking, in at least some extent, in truthfulness. The way of truth is correct, while the opinions of mortals are deluded and create false distinctions. Through this first interpretation, the only reason that the goddess tells Parmenides the way of seeming is to allow him to hold his own amongst the natural philosophers of his time. Hence it is said, I declare to you all the ordering as it appears, so that no mortal judgment may ever overtake you. Despite the young man knowing the way of truth, he can still discuss these false appearances with his peers. The second interpretation still holds the way of seeming to be wrong, but rather than simply allowing Parmenides to hold his own amongst intellectual discussions, this interpretation views the section on the way of seeming as a means to reinforce the way of truth, through showing a number of false premises, like the possibility of binary opposites, the section on opinion undermines conventional understanding and points one towards the way of truth. Our normal way of viewing the world is based on falsehoods and proves to be an illusion only for us to move towards the reality of being. This interpretation may be held in conjunction with a prior, since it is possible to both view the way of seeming as the means for Parmenides to hold his own in the latest cosmological discussions and for this way of seeming to be self-undermining and incoherent ultimately, proving the permanence of being. These two positions take Parmenides to be wholly against opinion, but a number of scholars warn that we must keep in mind that it is improper, despite being quite common, to turn Parmenides, or rather the goddess, into an intractable opponent of the truth of becoming an opinion, and on two accounts he may actually be a proponent of opinion. Despite ardent criticisms of the way of mortals, the goddess never actually contested the existence of becoming as it pertains to mortals. The third interpretation holds that the way of truth and the way of seeming are somehow consistent with one another. This account relies on the belief that Parmenides had worked out the difference between an existential non-being, as when one says that there is no chair, and a predicative non-being, as when one says 
that the chair is not green. You can't have nothing, but you can have non-predicates. If Parmenides was aware of this distinction, then the way of truth can simultaneously disprove the possibility of an existential non-being, while accepting the possibility of the predicate of non-beings that constitute the way of seeming. Through this understanding, the goddess is telling Parmenides that things can appear to be coming in and out of being, and that these differences can be worked out, so long as one recognizes the underlying reality that there is just being. The fourth interpretation is easily the most demanding of them all. First, it views the way of truth as self-refuting, because it begins with premises that assume the existence of a separate thinker that the distinct goddess is speaking to, yet concludes that there is no possibility for differentiation amongst them. And if one adopts monism, then there can't be a goddess, words, thinker, or any differentiation. Hence, the view holds the way of truth to be self-refuting. But it also holds that this self-refutation was done deliberately by Parmenides to see just how far one can reason using first principles alone. And the result proves that reason alone, being self-refuting, can't take one very far. Thus, one must rely on their knowledge other than reason, the data offered by their senses. Yet, reason and the way of seeming find opposite conclusions. Parmenides says that truth is a sphere, but since the limit is ultimate, it is complete from all directions, like the bulk of a ball, well-rounded from all sides. Through this perspective, Parmenides is less a metaphysician and more a dialectician, like his student Zeno. Each of these, in their own way, attempt to make sense of the final words of the proem. But nevertheless, you will learn these too, how it were right that the things that seem be reliably, being indeed the whole of things. Upon his introduction, Parmenides is often contrasted with another pre-Socratic, Heraclitus of Ephesus. Even in my notes for my video on Heraclitus, I had written, Heraclitus takes the position opposite to Parmenides. But a closer look at the two philosophers and their thought may suggest otherwise. First off, it is important to lay out that there is relative certainty that neither of the two philosophers knew each other, or even knew of each other. Only Plato has held that the two interacted, and his position was that Parmenides influenced Heraclitus. Yet, Plato's account is rejected by all modern scholars. Heraclitus preceded Parmenides, having lived in Ephesus during the turn of the century in 500 BCE, and DeLong estimates his death at around 475 BCE. Heraclitus, who only wrote one work, wrote it in the last years of his life and stored it in the Temple of Artemis, only to be seen by a select few. The earliest by which Heraclitian thought could have reached Elia was 450 BCE, a date certain to be after Parmenides' lifetime. Beyond this, there are far more similarities between their philosophies than differences. On the surface, there does appear a difference between Parmenides, who had said, coming to be has been extinguished, and perishing cannot be investigated, and Heraclitus, who said, upon those who step into the same stream, ever different waters flow. This quote has often been interpreted as the articulation of a metaphysics of change. In my video on Heraclitus, I also explored an alternative interpretation, utilizing an alternative translation of the same Greek words. On those stepping into rivers, staying the same other and other waters flow. This is to be interpreted as not only advocacy of the appearance of flux, but paradoxically, also of the condition of constancy. Although the waters flow, the river remains because it is only a river so long as its waters flow. This, then, is another example of the Heraclitian idea of the unity of opposites. As he said, what is in opposition is in agreement, and the most beautiful harmony comes out of things in conflict. And, for Heraclitus, it was not only that these opposites were in agreement, but also unified into one divine logos, saying, Unity is from everything, and from everything is unity. Through one interpretation, Parmenides had suggested something similar, and if one takes Parmenides' way of seeming to have any truth, then he too accounted for change. Parmenides had said that, While we look at the change between night and day, 
These are only names covering up the underlying unity. Hence, both may be interpreted as advocating a form of possibly dialectical monism. Being for Parmenides was whole. For Heraclitus, the Logos, the same for all, was made neither by gods nor by humans. But it was always, and is, and will be, fire ever living, being lightened in measures and going out in measures. Both also have little respect for the common moral view, which they hold in common to be missing divine knowledge. As Parmenides' goddess had said of them, within them there is no trust. Heraclitus says, most people do not comprehend however they encounter such things, nor do they understand what they learn. They believe only themselves, and suggested that human opinions are children's playthings. It appears that reducing the two to be philosophical adversaries has come at the cost of examining great overlap between the ideas of the two. Although, these similarities in thought are not to be interpreted as the two influencing each other, or just coincidence, because it is most likely that the two had shared an influence, the most probable of which was the earlier Xenophanes. Of course, this video did not capture every complexity of the many interpretations of Parmenides, so let me know if you think I missed anything. But that's all I've got to talk about today. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to leave a like and subscribe. If not, let me know why down below. As always, if you thought I got anything wrong, or have any thoughts, let me know in the comments below. And, until next time.